I want to um, start the conference by this rather ambitious title. I'll put it on full screen so that um, you can see it. Um, universities in the knowledge economy, mapping, managing, gendering, and contesting boundaries in the U new university industrial complex. So if that doesn't do it, then where are we? I'm not going to be able to answer your friends 10 questions, but probably quite a few others. The aim of my talk is I'm going to try, as Chris mentioned, to bring together a kind of large scale view of what's happening and focus it down on detailed ethnography to try and look at large issues in small places with apologies to Highland uh, Erickson for contorting his title. So I've got three questions. One, how are universities positioned in the new complex of organisations that make up what is called the global knowledge economy? Secondly, how are universities being created as a new kind of subject that is expected to negotiate new relationships and boundaries with diverse economic, political and social interests in surrounding society? And third, how do these transformations affect the values and daily work of academics and how do they respond? And this is to uh, give you a kind of a visual of a way of thinking about uh, universities in the knowledge economy. In the central circle, there's what used to be called the university sector, with universities in the middle, but in some cases also university colleges are included in that sector. In some cases, government research institutes are also included in that sector. And they will have some kind of relationship with the ministry or ministries that are uh, responsible for those issues. But then there will also be the uh, Rector's Association, the Students' Union and Academic Union, various other interest groups um, in, in that sector. And that is in a rather vague and weirdly coloured uh, red. It's actually come out sharper on the screen than I expected because I think that boundary is fuzzy. It's being renegotiated. And one of the ways it's being renegotiated is with all these different interests around the university <coughs> at the moment. So if I can get my arrows, yeah. Can take you first of all to the industrial interests, and I've just picked out three IT, uh, pharmaceuticals, engineering, and the chrysanthemum is a representation by Sheila Slaughter of all of the industrial interests on the boards of American universities. They are obviously wanting to um, engage with universities as partners, but also extract knowledge from universities. Secondly, and here I start also introducing uh, some of the fellows. So this happy chap in the middle is Chris, who is a fellow who's working on looking at what's happening to the publishing industry. So around him, there are the big publishers, but also the open source uh, publications. There's a whole new complex of uh, interests in publishing. What's happening to them and how do they relate with the university? Next, you've got the audit companies which are playing an enormous role in universities. There isn't a fellow in there, but you could put Chris and my faces in there as people who are working on it. Then we introduce Miguel. Um, who's looking at the rankings industry. Um, some are global rankers, others are for particular countries or regions, others for particular disciplines. It's a whole new industry of ranking that is obviously relating with the university. Then we introduce Freya and uh, Janja, who are working on different aspects of the international trade in higher education. This guy is not one of our fellows. <laughs> um, his name is Michael Masters, and he's the 
um, he's a, uh, the manager of something called Better Markets. He's looking at the uh, financial interests of universities and points out that uh, between 2003 and 2008, so that's five years, um, the university endowments, mainly in the States, and pension funds uh, moved their investments into commodity trading. And that went from 13 billion in 2003 to 260 billion in 2008, shooting the price of food and other commodities sky high and having big effects on uh, worldwide poverty. So there's a, the universities are actually having a financial role in, in international markets. They themselves are being uh, credit rated by Standard and & Poor and Fitch. And they're also taking out bonds in the financial markets, notably Cambridge's enormous bond to build a new quarter of um, the whole city of Cambridge. Then there are consultancies and pressure groups. Um, Tatiana is uh, looking at the role of think tanks and their relationship with universities. And Sina is looking at the role, for example, of the Magna Charta Universitatum um, and the uh, views of uh, academic autonomy. Um, so what I'm trying to do by mapping this is not only introducing you to some of the fellows in the uh, project, but also with all of these different interests around the universities, there are new uh, relationships being forged between the universities and these different bubbles, if you like. The other faces in the picture are uh, another six of our fellows who are working on different aspects of uh, education or uh, doctoral education, gender and management, alternative ideas of the, future, uh, of the university, um, the social role of the university, and roles of universities in uh, regionalism and autonomy. So that, in a way, maps our project because we've strategically positioned the fellows in these different bubbles around the university as a way to try and put a picture together of what's going on. And the point I want to make about this is that universities used to be thought of as supporting an economy but now they're also academic, uh, sorry, economic actors themselves. They're producing knowledge, which, as Sheila Slaughter says, is the raw material to be mined by industry and drive innovation. They're producing the labor force for the knowledge economy. And they are themselves meant to be globally competitive, international, high in global rankings, which is one way of being the equivalent of a company's bottom line, it shows the results of, of a university of being world class. Now, if we start looking within Europe, let alone if we start making comparisons between Europe and the Asia Pacific Rim, the constellation of those interests and the kinds of relationships that each university or each sector will have with those relationships will be very, very different. And I think it's going to be interesting in the course of this conference to start mapping out the precise differences in different countries in different parts of the world. So the role of universities in the knowledge economy, my map might act as a kind of sketch map, but now we need to detail up more closely exactly what these relationships are in specific places. The World Bank and the OECD and various uh, international actors have set up policies prescriptions as if the world is flat and as if the, the same prescriptions can work everywhere. And uh, this, for example, on the challenge of establishing world-class universities, says that the way the universities should react to this new role in the uh, knowledge economy is to make sure they have a concentration of talent, bringing in the best faculty and students, have abundant resources, get appropriate governance forms and strong leadership. Now, the picture on the front of their um, book is from Suchow University in China. 
it's the kind of the space age architecture that I suppose this building is also part of. But the exemplar that they use in their appendix of the best university that's diligently embarked on this path is Denmark. Um, so I'm going to focus down now my general sketch map onto a particular case in Denmark and look at the Danish university reforms. And this language of the Danish university reforms echoes very much that World Bank document. It also echoes, echoes other documents coming out of the OECD. So the reason for re reforming the universities in 2003 in Denmark was to get them to drive Denmark's competitiveness in the global knowledge economy. In 2006, they set up what they called the Globalization Council, and it explicitly said that the aim was to make sure that Denmark remained as one of the richest countries in the world. And the aim was to do that by giving the university three statutory obligations. Now, this isn't quite the legalistic language of the Act. I've rather um, uh, put my own language in here. Um, but the first one is to produce knowledge that industry can harvest, and that is the language of the, uh, in, uh, the Danish Confederation of uh, Industry. That industry can harvest for innovations. And the minister's own slogan from the reform, for the reform was, from idea to invoice. <laughs> The second aim of the reforms was to bring in what's called the Bologna process, but now we know that there's as many Bologna processes as there are countries in, in Europe. Um, so the Danish version of the Bologna process, which would change the education curriculum and produce employment-ready graduates, like oven-ready bread, um, with not just subject knowledge, but transferable skills and work experience, group work, problem solving, being a self-starter plus a team player. And our colleague at, uh, Denmark, in Denmark, Lara Louise Sarau, has studied this process very closely and showed how Denmark was ahead of the wave. It was putting in a more extreme version of the skill-based <coughs> curriculum than actually the Bologna process came to ask for. The third role of the university was to engage with surrounding society by knowledge exchange and dissemination with industry, society, and in public debate. If the, three, if the universities did that, then the idea was that the universities would restore politicians' trust in them so that politicians could increase the public funding of universities so that they could play this role. And this is a very important point because there's so much fuss made about the UK's uh, unviable financial model of fee-based education, uh, that that's becoming to look like the European model. But in fact, there are a lot of European countries which are still entirely publicly, or mainly publicly funding, funded. The education is still entirely publicly funded for the three-year BA and the, uh, the three-year two-year MA, and the overall education is still considered to be a five-year program. Um, so this is a public education sector still, and I want to emphasize that point. But the reason I think why it is still a public education is the first bullet point here, because industry does not want a privatized uh, university system, because then it would have to contribute more to paying for it. At the moment, it's an argument for having a good public education system with high investment by the government that can then be harvested by the private sector. Another thing that was going to achieve this role of universities in the knowledge economy was to merge the large multi-faculty mm -hmm. universities with the single faculty universities and the government research institutes to make large universities. And then that would hopefully mean that the universities came higher up in the rankings. So the evidence of success, according to the Prime Minister, was that by 2020, at least one university from Denmark would be in the Times Higher Education's top 10 in Europe. 
there are two discourses of reform. Um, in both discourses, the government is setting universities free. But in one, it's a discourse of public sector reform to introduce stronger state steering. And the other, it's a discourse of releasing the power, uh, universities as a new power force in society. And there's a tension here between control and independent ambition. And this is a point that I want to um, follow through because they imply different forms of organization and leadership. The reforms in overall were called aim and frame steering and it brought in, uh, it changed the role of politicians so that they would just set the overall political aims for the sector. The universities were then set up as uh, what were called self-owning universities as agents contracted to provide services to the state. Um, they then had appointed leaders who were given freedom to manage, were paid by results and then came under a new system or an, uh, an amended system of state scrutiny and commercial auditing. The way this worked was it was called setting universities free of the state, um, but their lack of liquidity meant that the state could detail steer through output payments. So what was the new subjectivity of the universities? So the universities were set free. They were no longer in a ring-fenced and protected space, protected against economic and political interests. They were a free agent. Surrounding society, as it's called in the law, can make demands on the university to collaborate and exchange knowledge. So industry can make demands, political parties can make demands, social groups can make demands on what they want the university to do. But it's the university's own statutory responsibility to protect themselves, to protect their own research freedom and their own ethics. And the way the mechanism they're meant to use to protect themselves is contracts. So they're free to negotiate contracts to surrounding society and in those contracts protect their freedom. But this begs a big question, I think. Who is the university? Who is deciding how to respond to the demands from stakeholders to organize the knowledge exchange with surrounding society and position the university in the knowledge uh, economy? Is it the new governing board? Is it the appointed rector? Is it academics themselves? Is it academics and students collectively? Who is it? And are there any university processes for protecting their freedom? The governing boards and the uh, managers have no established processes for protecting freedom. And the formerly uh, deliberative forums in the university have now been uh, either abolished or diminished. So there are no spaces to discuss issues and raise them with management. So this has given rise to a number of sites of contestation. This is a picture of our then minister who brought through the reforms and one of his uh, famous, other, another of his famous uh, phrases was it takes two to tango. So universities and industry should tango together. And when I saw this office, big picture of his office with a picture of tango on the wall, I couldn't resist it. So the Danish minister says that the reform sets universities free, but what does he mean by that? And there's several meanings of freedom here. Free agents, self-owning. Self-owning means responsible for their own solvency, so they can go bust. And for, the, and for negotiating the demands of surrounding society. Freedom to enter into contracts, yes, in some ways, but also not free because it now became a statutory obligation to enter into a contract with the government which they weren't free to get out of. So it's not the same kind of freedom as in classical liberalism. Freedom to manage, 
the new appointed managers were given free, and one of our interviewees said this was freedom from fuss, democracy from democratic decision making about which colour to get the toilet roll, they told us. Um, now the managers were free to deliver on their performance indicators in any way they liked. And there was also a language of degrees of freedom. Once the university had got used to exercising this degree of freedom, they might get more. And finally, there is mention of research freedom, but it's been revised. Now research freedom means that it's a quality control mechanism so that industry and government can be sure that the uh, results are pucker. And the minister is quite clear that he's doing state steering through freedom. And one of his phrases was, we've given more freedom and responsibility, not freedom from responsibility but more freedom under responsibility. The Danish Academy of Science and Letters, which is where all the great and the good professors meet up, um, wrote a report on which they accused the minister of uh, undermining academic freedom. And they redefined academic freedom as the question, ability to question orthodoxy, choose your own research topic, engage in public debate, organise your own university affairs and criticise your own organisation. And they, they met, this picture is of the meeting between the minister and the authors of that report in the uh, hallowed halls of the Danish Academy of Science and Letters and they met either end of this long, shiny mahogany table. Um, and they push these words, this word freedom, backwards and forwards like a ping pong match. And the minister saying, I haven't undermined your freedom. And them saying, yes, you have. And in the end, he said, um, show me the bodies. Put the bodies on the table. And he was asking the Academy of Science to put the evidence, but put the bodies, a very physical, um, put the, the people who've um, been killed off by this system on the shiny mahogany table, which is the symbol of maintaining a nice appearance of order. Um, so there was a choice, either the academics put these rejected bodies in the center of order, or else those who'd survived by uh, maintaining silence, cast themselves out by speaking up. And I'm using here Christopher's idea of abjection, kind of a pushing out, casting out, and he was um, challenging the academics to bring the cast out into the centre of their hallowed hall. Though he was met with complete silence and he stalked out of the room as a clear victor from that interchange. So there's two semantic clusters around the idea of freedom, and the ministers really became very uh, strong at that point. So I want to look now at the processes by which those who try to assert a residual idea of freedom and its social practices and values reveal or disturb the emergent order of the new concept of freedom and its way of ordering universities. Or how, like what Mary Douglas called matter out of place in the emergent social order, they're cast out, rejected or objected. Within this idea of uh, the new university, there are two concepts of the leader. And I've used the old language of transactional and transformative. There's the transactional leader who's heroic, the change agent of reform, who is working through a vision and determination to reshape the institution in the image of the political masters, and uses a centralization of power to do that and an abrasive, determined, quick, decisive style. Or else there's the transformative idea of the leader uh, independently releasing the power force of the university um, which would exceed the politician's imagination 
and doing that by a charismatic vision which inspires and nurtures everyone to pursue the uh, corporate objectives or performance indicators. And that kind of leader is visualized as working through relationships, not authority, and instilling in everyone responsibility for being enterprising and exercising self-leadership. But both of these uh, ideas of leadership use the rhetoric of inspirational leaders creating flexible organizations. But I think uh, Clark and Newman point out that quite often what's happening is that that rhetoric is being combined with an expanded array of strategies for enhanced management control. So there's a kind of a transformative discourse of leadership working in a transactional fashion. There's also an issue, as Pat O'Connor says, of think leadership, think male. When leadership is defined in those terms, especially in the transactional terms, there's a, a kind of particular masculinity which some fear, men feel comfortable with. But it's turned into a kind of generalized masculinism in which gender is denied it's unmentioned, it's as if it's invisible. It's like what Ruth Frankenberg called unmarked whiteness. It's an unmarked masculinity in which male privileging is seen as a norm and women become an other. Now women particularly become an other here because there is a very, very small minority of senior women and women in leadership, in particular, are very, very visible. Senior women who are not in leadership, and this is what I'm interested in, become challenging, disrupting, maybe frightening, or barriers to the leaders achieving their roles. Dora Marie Sunegor has done a, a big study of uh, women in leadership in Danish universities. And she's identified two possible discourses that they're <coughs> inhabiting or they're, they're uh, enacting. In, in One is the science of uh, the standards of science discourse, as if uh, the proper values of science are gender neutral and if we follow them then everything's fine. And the other one is the academic academia is decentral discourse, where women understand that they should not uh, disrupt the subtle processes of negotiation, alliance and exchange of favours that's going on and should show themselves loyal and useful to those who are powerful. When I was reading her work, I thought, well, some women actually um, use the latter to achieve the former, but they didn't crop up in her study. So let's just quickly glance at the percentage of women in university senior management. And actually, it's quite difficult to find a consistent set of figures on here. But in uh, the EU 27, there's only 10% of university rectors who are women. In Denmark, we now have one, so she constitutes 8%. Um, even if you look across to heads of department, 17% of heads of department in Denmark are women, which is tiny. There's a better representation on the national research boards. But then look at the success of getting research funding. I just picked on the natural sciences. And look at the very small number of heads of centres of excellence, which is another way in which funding is moving. This is uh, the usual kind of scissor diagram of um, the proportion of men and women at different rungs in the academic career in the Nordic region. Um, but this shows you, if you look on the total line across the bottom, the second figure in each, Nearly 17% of, of professors were women in 2012. Nearly 13% were at lectureship. Then 40% are postdocs. And 45% were PhDs. So you can see the um, decline of the uh, representation of women in senior management, in senior positions. Um, I was reading um, Helena Kennedy, who's now become head of a, a one of the Oxford colleges, and she said, um, 
the usual argument about why aren't the women in senior positions is that, well, it's a slow evolution and, um, and we're waiting for suitable candidates to reach the top. She said, like, women will get equality when fish grow feet. And then I was uh, watching the news coming out of um, Florida of catfish who've now learnt to breathe and are using their fins to waddle their way around uh, people's decks and in their garages. And Route 41 is dangerously slippery with smashed catfish. So the fish have got there before the women. <laughs> I want to end um, by coming back to the question that I was asking at the beginning about the way in which the university negotiates its boundaries with this new complex that it's located in. Um, and to ask what kind of university subject is produced, what kind of academic subject is being produced, and who is preserving what kind of freedom. And I've got four case studies which I'm going to um, go through. The first one, and these case studies are all, um, they're the four big public conflicts that have happened around the university boundaries in the last few years and have really hit the national media. So this is my choice of selection, is that they're, they're conflicts that have been in the national media. So the first one I think is a, 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 a woman leader who has um, taken the second of Daughter Marie's paths um, of being a conforming leader. And this is a case of the university's re reworked boundary with industry. So the Novo Foundation, which is one of the big companies in, uh, in Denmark that's concerned with life sciences, donated 885 million krona without any conditions to Copenhagen University's health science faculty to set up a center of basic research on metabolism. And the aim was to ensure a stable foundation for the business and research that drives the Novo company. The contract was kept secret. Um, it was not discussed in any academic forums. Um, one of the newspapers put forward freedom of information requests and they revealed the following. Um, the negotiations had taken place before Copenhagen had uh, asked for the contract. So it was all negotiated prior to applying for the contract. The contract set up that there would be five research leaders, and one of them would be the current leader of one of Novo's research institutes. And he would bring his research group of 20 staff with him. In other words, Novo was moving part of its research and development into Copenhagen University. And the Novo researchers were given permission, uh, positions in Copenhagen University without advertising the jobs, which people initially thought was not right, but there was some little clause that made it legal. Um, Copenhagen University then co-financed this deal by 20 million krona, but the same year as it had fired 90 academics because it needed to make savings. The, they said that you know, Copenhagen University owns all the research which will be conducted at Copenhagen University, and Novo will own all the research conducted at Novo. But of course, the whole point of this was to mix the two up together. So how that will exercise, I don't know. The director of the Novo Foundation calls it an erasure of the boundaries between public research and commercially oriented private research. And the dean calls it Novo's visionary generosity and a pragmatic business transfer of personnel from industry to the university, which show Copenhagen University's flexibility, mobility, and new thinking. And in the process, she delivered her faculty's uh, contract target of 10% increase in external funding. So this is an example of, um, of a woman leader who's got involved in making a contract which is actually breaking down the barrier, barrier that used to be very clearly and securely maintained between academic research and industrial research. 
Second one is also about um, research boundaries. This is a, one of the government research institutes which was merged with Aarhus University. And that research institute had previously researched the serious health effects of a weed killer on farmers in Brazil, which was banned by the EU, but was sold by a Danish company in Brazil. And then this research institute is merged with Aarhus University, and they find that Aarhus University is a major shareholder of this chem chemical company, and it's the source of a lot of our research funding. So, Meda Jensen, who's a senior researcher, and four colleagues sent an email to their 480 colleagues in the research centre saying, do you think Keminova ought to stop producing and selling methyl power, whatever that is, and similar products, yes or no? And they promised to send the results to the rector. <coughs> Immediately, the director of the research institute informed them that they should, that uh, staff, that they shouldn't reply and gave uh, Meta a warning that she'd broken the Research Institute's internal rules by using the email system. She got 140 supply, uh, replies with 128 yes, so she, by this time isolated, wrote an open letter to the rector, published it in the university's newspaper and copied it to her director. Five minutes later, the director issued her with a formal warning that she hadn't followed the internal rules about using the, the email and she would be fired. Her union stepped in and um, pointed out that this uh, contravened her constitutional right of freedom of expression. Um, and eventually the leader threw out the warning, but she was terribly, terribly badly affected by this whole process and has moved to a different uh, institute. The third example is the issue of changing the uh, cu uh, curriculum and Maria Koldau was attracted from Germany and appointed as professor of music at Aarhus. For the first two years she expressed concern about the way in which the humanities education was on the one hand too theoretical and on the other hand too focused on employability. She got nowhere so in the end she went to the press and that upset the dean who commissioned two consultants to investigate the problems at the department and they declared that she was a difficult colleague, which is actually a sackable offence. Um, the dean issued an official warning and set conditions for her work, which were monitored by the consultants and the head of the department. She had to be in the department from nine till five, not go anywhere else without permission of the head of the department, withdraw her complaint about her colleagues bullying her, and write a letter of apology to each colleague with the dean providing the letter that she was to sign. She must not break what was called collegial confidentiality, which was a new <coughs> phrase which has not been found in any other of the legal material on uh, freedom of expression. In the end, the pressure was so great that she resigned and went back to Germany. And the last case is of uh, Marlene Wind, who is an expert on the EU, and when the Dance Folk Party, the Danish uh, Folk Party, um, insisted they were the support party for the government, insisted that the finance law reintroduce border posts between Germany and, uh, and Denmark and Sweden and Denmark, which contravened the Schengen Agreement, um, she got into a lot of tape t TV uh, coverage, and at one point completely lost her temper with these um, politicians on television. And they immediately uh, attacked her in public, uh, including, I think, writing to the rector, requiring him to sack her. Uh, and the head of the party announced on the media that wind is finished. The only way out of this was that the head of department put um, a, a muzzle on her and all the members of the, part, uh, of, of the department. They went completely quiet. They completely stopped talking to the press. The rector made a few mild comments about freedom of expression, but it was actually the minister who defended the right of the university to speak in public rather than the university itself. 
So here's another issue of who's defending freedom of expression and the freedom of the university. Those four, the last three cases in particular, are contested cases of the, the borders. So in conclusion, to sum up what I'm saying, universities are locating themselves or finding ways to locate themselves in this new industrial complex. And all stakeholders, including the Danish Folk Party, can make demands on the university. It's up to the university to defend its own research freedom and ethics. The new strategic leadership is exercising top-down control, a new masculine style in which gendering is invisibilized, but it makes senior women very visible as matter out of place. And the crunch points come with negotiating the university's new boundaries with surrounding society uh, on industrial research, on the relationship between university and commissioned research, on the employability of students, and on political debate. All cases focus on few, the few senior women. They're threatened and intimidating, but they stand up for freedom of expression and for academic freedom. And all three are cast out of the university in different ways, they're abject. Universities are not strongly defending the university's freedom. There's no effective forum for academics to debate these issues internally. And internal communication with our leaders is conducted through the national press. So the new strategic leadership is an instrument of government steering through freedom. But it's meant to be releasing the capacity of the university as a power force in society. But I just ask whether it's creating an abject university. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for pointing out some of the perils facing academic freedom, a theme that will be returned to on several of the panels. We have a few minutes, very few minutes, for questions. So can I open the floor up and invite questions? If you have them, please keep them brief to the point. We have revolving, uh, roving microphone holders. So, uh... Chris. Speak to me, Chris. <laughs> that was lovely, Sue. Thank you very much. In connecting these terms, I think that's really great job doing this. Imagine the university produced through informing leaders via um, you know, this kind of top down abjecting of, of senior women. Um, where are the faculty in this? Other colleagues? It's not like a <coughs> union agency, but aren't there other people helping any of these folks? There's no faculty organization. No, um, Meda Jensen, who wrote about the Keminova case, starts off with four colleagues. They desert her at the first sign of any trouble. Um, Maria Koldau was very much isolated within that department. There was very little attempt within Aarhus University to really support her or find out what the problem was and how to solve it. It was it. She was left in a very, very isolated position. And there is no real forums anymore for discussing these things. So there's an academic, there's no Senate. There's a governing board. There's no Senate to go with it where, where academics are. There are two representatives on the governing board and they're outnumbered by the externally appointed people. And they don't have really any forums for discussing what's going on on the board with the rest of the university community. Um, so they're kind of in a very isolated position on the board. There's then no Senate. And at faculty level, there is what's called an academic council, but their role is just to check the quality of PhDs and you know it's a quality assurance mechanism. It's been slightly expanded in its role. Um, but I still think one of its weaknesses is that it can, um, it can ask the rector for information on issues, but it, the rector isn't required to reply. And in, at uh, departmental level, the departmental uh, committees were, uh, we used to have a board which made decisions about the, the department. 
which then there was an executive officer to implement. Now there's a head of department and no board. One last question, quick one. Um, actually, it's more like a comment um, saying that um, my own research very much confirms what you say about Denmark. I prepared a country ranking of European member states' state of academic freedom in terms of the legislation. This Denmark ranking on uh, place number 25, 28, and a total percentage of less than 40%, also because of uh, rules on self governance. Yeah, thank you. Look forward to seeing that.